for today's webinar Wednesday brought to you by UK University Search. Today we're going to be talking about life at university, what you can expect as an undergraduate student and all the fantastic opportunities being a student opens up for you. We have four panellists from universities across the UK joining us today to discuss different topics and answer your questions as well. First up we have Lauren Williams from the University of Wales Trinity St David who will be talking about accommodation, looking at student halls, living on and off campus and the different things to consider when choosing where you want to live at university. Then we'll pass over to Usman Ahmed from the University of Bradford to talk about budgeting, looking after your money and living costs whilst you're at university. Next up is Megan Morris from the University of Roehampton who will be discussing how to balance your studies with your social life and why finding the right balance is so important to enjoying your time at university. And finally, we'll hear from Will Alkin from the University of Kent. He'll be talking to you about the amazing range of extracurriculars available at university, from societies to getting involved in the student union to part-time jobs and work experience. Each of them will also be introducing their university to give you an idea of why you might like to study with them. We'll be finishing up today with a question and answer session. So if you're viewing on Zoom and you'd like to submit a question, please click the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen and you can type your question in there. If you're viewing on YouTube, you can use the live chat on the side of your screen to submit a question. But please be aware that this chat is monitored by our representatives and any inappropriate content will be removed and reported to your school or college. OK, let's get started. I'm now going to pass you over to Lauren from the University of Wales, Trinity St David, and she's going to discuss university accommodation with you. Hi everyone, um, I hope that you're all keeping well. My name is Lauren and I'm a master's student at the University of Wales Trinity St David. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about accommodation and from a student's point of view. Um, so as well as being a master's student, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Wales Trinity St David. So I've lived in pretty much every type of accommodation there is to offer. So hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions you've got and give you a little bit more information. I'm just going to start off by saying that the information I'm going to give to you is quite specific to UWTSD, um, but all the, all the information can be quite transferable to other universities. So I recommend that you do some research and make sure you find out once you know which university you're going to go to that what they have to offer. And one way of doing that is going to open days. I strongly recommend going to open days because um, it's really important that you see the accommodation um, and make sure that you feel comfortable there. So the staff at the University of Wales Trinity St David, the accommodation staff and the student ambassadors definitely did that for me. So um, I was able to walk around the accommodation and they answered any questions that I had and I was able to see what was available. So make sure you do that. Most, uh, most, most universities offer accommodation on the campus or nearby. Living on campus uh, in the accommodation is a huge plus because it means that you're close to lectures, the university facilities, and you get to create a huge community of friends. So I strongly recommend that if that is a choice at the university that you've selected, that you take that. And going to university can be scary. So by being in a position where you're surrounded by a lot of people who are in the same boat as you, it really helps. Normally there's a shared kitchen and a communal area and by the time you start, you know, you're there in, in university, you're making meals together, you're socialising together and you're doing it together. So it, it's really useful. One of the highlights for me is definitely in my first year, um, after a long day of lectures, being able to de-stress with flatmates by playing a game of rounders in the field outside the accommodation, maybe having a couple of drinks later on and being a group of acting students, you can definitely recommend a couple sing songs. So it's such a shared experience. So I'm going to share with you a PowerPoint to give you some more specific information um, about UWTSD. Doesn't look like I'm able to share my screen. Uh, so I'll talk you through it instead. So the accommodation at the University of Wales Trinity St David um, is set up into uh, different specifics. So we have the Archbishop Noakes 
Um, and each room is an ensuite that's provided with a bed, a mattress, a wardrobe, bedside table, desk, chair, and bookcase. And it's a three-story building with three different flats on each floor, with eight single rooms in each flat. Each student has access to shared kitchens and communal space, and the university provides kitchen, fridges, freezers, toasters, kettle, microwave, and cookers. So to give you some uh, rough figures, the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, the accommodation fees for a single ensuite room um, with a contract length of 38 weeks uh, is an annual figure of £3,610, which is paid per term, which is really useful because it coincides with the student finance. So term one, you're looking at paying around about £1,425, the same in the second term, and then in the third term, it's slightly lower because it's a slightly shorter term. Um, our Lampeter campus is a beautiful campus and it's very similar uh, in the way that our accommodation is set up. So you have ensuite rooms um, with the wardrobe desk chair available to you. It's a flat of six or seven bedrooms and there is again a communal kitchen and lounge in each flat. Um, in our Swansea campus there is Lease Glass which is again quite similar. Um, it's self-catered. Um, I'll be able to show you some pictures now, hopefully. It'll be able to work for you. There we are. Yeah, so it's least glass. Um, it's self-catered on sweet halls. There's around about 80 rooms, shared kitchen and a 40-week tenancy, which is really useful because it covers you if you wanted to go home um, for Easter or for Christmas. And again, the fees um, are dependent on whether you have a medium, large or extra large size bedroom. A little bit more expensive just because it's based in the, the city. Um, but again, it's a lot more beneficial being on campus for you. So what is included in, in your accommodation? So all of your utility bills are included in that cost. So you don't have to worry about anything extra. Um, there's no extra cost for maintenance and there's 24-hour security there so you have that level of feeling safe um, especially in the Carmarthen campus it's a small little campus and you have porters and hall wardens and you have access to the accommodation team who can answer any questions that you have. So other types of accommodation um, you can live in nearby accommodation so rented properties in my second year of university, um, myself and five other actors moved into um, a property nearby, which was great because it gave you that um, little bit of distance between yourself and the university. Um, but still only being five, ten minutes walk away, um, it was really useful. You can also travel from home, so you don't have to um, move to the campus. Um, Travelling from home is also, also there for you. So when do I need to apply for, for the accommodation? So most um, accommodation applications open in January. If you are applying specifically to the University of Wales Trinity St. David, the application forms are included with your offer letter or they can be located on the website. So this works for um, any university that you're going to have a look on their website, get in touch with their accommodation team and make sure you're keeping on top of that. So how does the application process work? So you'll receive um, an application from the, through email. You'll then have to email them back to confirm um, the, the safe receipt. You'll then receive a license agreement, which you'll need to complete an email back to them. And then you'll be required to put down a deposit um, for the University of Wales Trinity St. David specifically. It's £250. You'll then be sent the payment link um, in an email. If you have any issues, the accommodation office are there for you to, to speak to. Um, and then you'll be sent confirmation of your, of your room. So Fab, thank you very much for listening to me. If you have any questions, then um, I'll be more than happy to answer them for you and I'm going to pass back over to Megan now. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Lauren. I'm now going to pass you over to Usman from the University of Bradford, and he's going to be talking to you about budgeting at university, how to look after your money and make sure that it's going as far as you need it to. Hello everyone, um, hopefully you can see me. Um, my name is Usman Ahmed, I'm from the University of Bradford, um, and I'm here to share some tips with you in regards to budgeting um, and how to manage your finances whilst at university. So I'm just gonna share my screen um, so we can hopefully see everything that's going on. Great. Brilliant. Okay. So, like I've said, um, I've been asked to talk a bit about how to manage your finances whilst at university, and we're going to look at budgeting as well. Um, but to give you a bit of an introduction to myself, so I have studied at the University of Bradford. Um, I did both my undergraduate degree uh, in combined clinical and social sciences, and I did my master's as well in cancer pharmacology um, at the university. So, again, I've really tried to put some tips and tricks. Um, based on the experiences that I've had um, to make sure that the advice we're giving is applicable and that actually it is beneficial to students as well. So hopefully there will be things in here that you might not have come across um, or they will help you particularly when going to university. Okay, so really when thinking about managing money for university, um, we need to first initially think about the income that's coming in um, and and I'm going to talk a bit about how you can maximize that income. Um, so you have as much money as possible to help you have the best experience at university as possible. We're then going to be looking at expenditure. Um, so the money that you're spending, your key essential costs um, like rent um, for accommodation, et cetera, food costs, maybe travel costs as well. And then we're gonna start thinking about um, different strategies um, to help you budget as well. So how can you manage that money that's coming in to make sure at the end of the semester or the end of the term, um, you're not running out of money and falling into your overdraft. Okay, so to begin, um, really, I want to think about how we can maximize um, your income. Um, so this is trying to make sure that you have the most money available to you when you start university. Um, so hopefully most of you already have done your student finance um, and the key part of your income for university will be your maintenance loan. Um, and this is really dictated by your household income. But as an example, if we say you got the maximum um, loan, uh, it would be approximately £9,000. If you're down south, close to London, there is some London waiting and you can uh, get a bit more money as well to help you with your costs. This will be spread out um, across the year, so across the three sem uh, semesters, so you get approximately £3,000 per semester um, with a payment coming in in September at the beginning of your academic year and then after Christmas in January and then looking at April um, around Easter. Outside of this £9,000 or the three instalments of £3,000 that you're getting, um, many universities will have grants, bursaries and scholarships that you can apply for as well. And this is essentially additional money um, that you don't have to pay back that can help you uh, with your finances. Okay, but for these grants, scholarships and bursaries, there might be additional criteria that you have to meet. Um, so I did initially want to say, for example, uh, students with disabilities, care, uh, carers or care experience, experience students, as well as Australian students and refugees, there are already pots of money uh, for this group of students to enable them to overcome uh, barriers that they might be experiencing at university anyway. So if you, um, if you align with any of those categories, then definitely um, there are pots of money that you can apply to. So for example, at the University of Bradford, um, any student who's a carer or care experience, so if you've been in local authority care as a child, um, you have £1,000 available to you and really that's assessed through your UCAS application. Um, so if you make that information available to us and let us know, then essentially you'd automatically get that £1,000 per year as long as your household income is below £30,000. Outside of that, so that's just one example of um, a grant that we might have. 
but outside of that, um, there's lots of scholarships as well. So if you go onto our scholarships website, for example, and again, this is the same for most universities, um, there will be lots of scholarships and money that you can apply to to help you with your living costs. So one example of this is our Academic Excellence Scholarship. So for those students who achieve three A's um, in the A-levels, for example, or triple distinction for BTEC, and they come from low participation neighbourhoods, um, they are able to apply um, for our scholarship and they can get up to £3,000. Um, so per year, uh, they get approximately £1,000. So they're guaranteed in the first year to get that £1,000 after the first year and the second and third year, as long as they're achieving that 58% average, um, they'll get the additional money as well. But again, like I've said, many universities will have these scholarships across the board and there'll be lots of scholarships that are not linked to academic excellence. So they might be linked to, um, if you've got a sporting background and you're interested in being involved in sports, um, they might be uh, linked to certain criteria that you meet for the university in regards to low participation neighbourhood or from a particular background. First in family, for example, is a particular one at Bradford. So if you're the first in your family to come to university, you can apply um, for particular scholarships and get that money as well. Outside of scholarships, then additional sort of money you can get bursaries. So at the University of Bradford, for UK and EU students, uh, we have a bursary scheme as well. So if you're family household income is below £30,000, um, you can get this money, which is approximately £500 in your first year, £600 in your second year, and £700 in your third year. Um, and again, it doesn't sound like a lot, but if you think about costs such as costs for equipment you might need for your programme, um, I know for me, for example, I had to buy a lab coat, um, especially books for academic programmes can be quite expensive. Um, so all of this money can really help increase the income that you have whilst at university and then help you budget more appropriately and manage your expenses. So one key thing at the bottom there, it says make sure you give consent for information to be shared with your university through your student finance application. So there is a tick box on your student finance application that asks, um, asks you if you want to give permission to share your information. Um, with your universities. Um, so as long as you click that, um, all of that information will be shared with the uni universities. And if there are any um, bursaries or scholarships that you're eligible for, um, you should be notified. For us, for example, if you are eligible for the bursary, it will automatically be applied. If you're eligible for scholarships, you'll be contacted to be told you could apply for this scholarship. Okay, so once we've maximised our income and ensured that we're accessing um, the money that we qualify for, really we want to be realistic in understanding what our costs are. And this is where a lot of students um, do go wrong. And I know in my first year, for example, going to university, um, I had never been to university before. I didn't really have contact with family members who had been to university. So I really didn't know how much university would cost in that first year, what accommodation costs would be, you know, even simple things like traveling, um, the course books, et cetera. So I wanted to point a few things out um, that will hopefully help you think about your costings. And what you want to do is create something like a mind map um, or even on an Excel sheet, just put down your key costs and start a budgeting sort of uh, document or file. So one of the biggest costs for students when they're going to university is accommodation, and this is going to take the bulk of your budget. Um, on average, based on the research that I've done, um, particularly in cheaper cities, for example, your accommodation costs about £140 per week, um, so that's £560 per month. Um, if we think about that in terms of the maintenance load that you're getting, if you're getting £3,000 in semester to last you October, November, December, um, that's approximately 1,600 um, just on accommodation. But, so that's almost half of your maintenance loan being spent in that first semester um, on accommodation. So it is important to think about um, the city that your university is in because that will impact your cost. So Bradford, for example, is quite a cheap city. Um, and I know our on-campus accommodation now um, 
has reduced its price. So it's approximately, depending on how you're living, it's about £96 um, per week. Um, also to understand with accommodation, are your utilities included or are they not included? So most students, if they live in halls, this will be included. Um, but if you then look at private accommodation, your utilities might not be included. So that's things like your electricity, your gas, um, if you have to have a TV license, for example. So you need to think about all of these things. Transport, I put transport on here because again, a lot of students for your accommodation, you might be living further out in the city and you might have to regularly get a bus in or you might have to get on a train. If you're commuting, for example, um, and you're not choosing to live out in accommodation. So all of this is going to add to your costs. Um, so think about your monthly bus pass if you're using a bus. Um, can you get a rail card? So a young person's rail card, for example, if you apply, you will get a discount on regular rail travel. Um, and where you can get really good advice for this is the student room. Um, it's an independent forum where students will give very honest advice. Um, so they will tell you and review particular accommodation for you and tell you if it was good or if it was too far away from campus. Um, and the reason why this is important is, you know, if you do have lectures in the morning at nine o'clock, um, it will affect what time you have to get up. It will affect um, your organisation in that day. So do think about these things. This is why probably more students take accommodation on campus for their first year, just so it's easier um, to get to lectures on time and sort of manage their time accordingly. So like I said, most university uh, students will stay in halls of residence. Most universities, based on my research, will guarantee you um, a place in their halls of residence. Um, and we have different uh, contracts as well. So we have term time contracts. And for those students who can't go home or choose not to go home, we have year long contracts as well. Um, as my colleague already mentioned, you know, some of this accommodation will be en suite, shared, um, or you can get independent sort of one bedroom accommodation as well. I put there, make sure you arrange a visit for accommodation on your tour. And somebody asked that question. Um, currently, obviously, with everything that's going on, um, you can't go onto campus and have that tour. But most universities have a virtual tour online where you can actually explore the campus and they'll have videos. Um, for you to watch in regards to the accommodation. And for us, we have a web chat service where you can talk to current students. Um, so you could speak to them as well to find out what their accommodation experience was like. And finally, I've just put their insurance included. So particularly for us, for your first year experience, um, the green, which is our on-campus accommodation, does have insurance. So it covers your belongings. And a lot of students don't think about this. Um, but it is something to think about in terms of your costs. If you've got expensive laptops and equipment that you're taking with you to university, it is a, a worthwhile investment. Outside of this, you've got your initial course costs. So like I've already mentioned, books, materials, but there's lots of advice and guidance. You know, you can buy these books secondhand. Um, there's different shops. Lots of students who are graduating will sell these books as well. Uh, and if you have an on-campus bookshop, most of those will have discounts um, for students when they're arriving on campus. And then finally, you have your sort of actual food and shopping costs. Um, some top tips for this, really, I think what would be good to do is plan your meals in advance. If you can create a sort of a weekly meal plan, you can then log in onto your supermarket website uh, and have a rough estimate of what your weekly shop will be costing. Um, so it means when you go into the shops, you're not just spending money based on the offers that you're seeing. You've already thought about what you're buying for the meals that you're cooking. Uh, and lots of students really struggle with food shopping. Um, so it's one to think about. Socialising. Um, you know, this does affect your student budget. I think initially, if it's your first experience of living away from your family as well, um, you're meeting new people, you want to socialise and maximise that experience. Um, so you can very easily spend a lot of money on this. But things to think about are there's a lots of events that happen on campus um, that are very cheap. You know, if you join societies, they will be organising socials as well. Um, so you've got a lot of opportunity to socialise cheaply on campus to get to know um, students you're studying with. OK, and then just a few tips and tricks for budgeting um, that you can think about. 
Well, I would recommend, like I've already said, you get your student finance payments in, in installments um, based on advice and guidance from um, websites like Money Supermarket. The recommendation is when you have your student account, most uh, banks will allow you to create a savings account online. So if you create a savings uh, account online that is separate to your current account and put um, your key costs into that, so your essential costs into that, as soon as your student finance hits your account, you can put your rent into that account, you can put the money that you've calculated for utilities and for food shopping into that account or into another additional online account. It means there's not a bunch of money just sitting in your current account um, and therefore you're not tempted to think, oh wow, I've got £3,000 in my account, I can just go and spend it. Um, so once you've transferred all of uh, the money that you need for your essential costs into a separate savings account or an online account, as and when you need to pay and spend that money, you can transfer things back into your current account to be used. Um, other advice I can give, speak to your parents or older siblings um, or people who have been to university. So once you create a bit of a budget uh, and an expense list, maybe get advice um, from them to see if what you've listed is realistic um, and if they have any tips and tricks as well. And then finally, most universities will have a money advice team. So you, uh, all you guys are current applicants. Um, so even if you just want advice and guidance from that university about uh, budgeting, about the cost living in that particular city, um, you can already contact the money advice team and they should be able to help you. So if you go on most universities' website and search money advice or financial support, you'll be able to find the team um, that can help you. And I have put a link in my presentation, but there's a website called Save the Student. Um, and again, they've got some budgeting guides and some Excel sheets that will help you um, analyze your costs um, and your predicted sort of uh, estimated costs of being away at university. So this is what your budgeting sheet might look like. You know, once you've thought about income and maximize your income, um, you then want to make a list of your sort of outgoings um, and put figures next to that. These can be average costs or um, costs that you've found by contacting um, universities themselves. And then finally, um, that will allow you to understand how much money you have left over um, at the end of each month or at the end of each term. Okay, final top tips, just very quickly then. Um, there's other ways to maximize your income. So I've already spoken about grants, scholarships, um, but lots of universities have emergency funds. So if you do get in financial trouble um, or your circumstances change, um, universities have emergency pots of money that you can apply to. So do find out about that. Many you know, advice centers, um, so speak to them once you've got your plan together and you know find out if there's any other pots of money you can apply to. And then finally, uh, on-campus jobs and part-time jobs. So at the University of Bradford, depending on the course that you're doing, there's lots of on-campus jobs. You know, most of our library assistants, our students, we have jobs in our shops and in the bars um, and I'm the student ambassador. So sharing your first, uh, your university experience with um, applicants. So all of those at the University of Bradford currently are paid at the living wage particularly. Um, so that will bring in a bit more money. Other top tips, make sure you get a student account um, and look and think about the benefits you're getting from those student accounts and what you will use the most. So for example, some will give you a very large overdraft, a 0% overdraft, so you're not being charged if you go into your overdraft. If you're worried about um, you know, using that overdraft regularly, maybe think about getting a big overdraft, but it is helpful. Um, other benefits that you might try and get are things like a rail card, um, gift vouchers, you know, Netflix subscription. So depending on your own circumstances, think about the mode of transport you're using, um, the kind of things uh, and the experiences you want to have at university and how these student accounts and the benefits they offer will help you with that. The NUS Extra Card, for example, it provides additional discounts um, to the normal student discounts um, that you get in shops and stores as well. And then I've put the website there for moneysavingexpert.com. Uh, um, they've got loads of guides and supports as well. So make sure you access them um, to understand more. So this was the emergency fund I was talking about. We have a student support fund. So anyone who during their university experience is 
in financial difficulty or something has happened to change your circumstances, we can make an award of up to £2,000. Um, but obviously for this, you have to make an application and put forward evidence as well. But do know that there is emergency funding and support. Okay, so um, for any questions, you've got our money advice team's email there. So it's money at bradford.ac.uk. Especially those students who are coming to Bradford or thinking about coming to Bradford, do get in touch and just make sure that your sort of budgeting and your plan is secure. But you can also go on our website, which is bradford.ac.uk forward slash money, um, and that will help you um, to see uh, what resources we have available as well. Okay, so I'll pass back to Megan. Hopefully that was quite a lot of information, um, but there's lots of resources and links there as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Osman. Next up, we're going to be talking. She's from the University of Roehampton, and she's going to be talking to you about how to balance your studying and your social life. So we pass over to Megan now. Hi everyone, my name is Megan and I am a higher education advisor at the University of Roehampton. Um, I also went to the University of Roehampton and I was a dance student and I graduated last year and today I'm going to be talking to you about student life and how to balance your study and student life whilst at university. I'm just going to share my screen with you please. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to be talking about the difference between campus and city universities. So a campus university is a university where everything is located on one site. This includes accommodation, leisure, teaching and research facilities. A city university is located in a bigger city and all the facilities and students are often spread out across the city. Uh, at Roehampton, we like to say it's the best of both worlds because we are a campus university where everything is located on one site. However, we are just 30 minutes away from central London in southwest London. So it really is the best of both worlds. We are also London's very own Parkland Campus University with 54 acres. So some universities have a college system. At Roehampton, we have four different colleges here on campus. So we have Whitelands with the Badgers, Southlands Sharks, Digby Lions and the Froebel Zebras. These colleges are represented by students throughout the events of the College Cup. Uh, kind of like Harry Potter, we even have a Quidditch match at the end of the year. Um, there are also other events such as Frigby, which is a big football match against two of the bigger campuses, which is Frogball and Digby. And we also have college uh, nights out at BOP, which are themed, sort of the Whitelands, Frogball, all of that. Uh, this not only promotes friendly competition between the colleges, but it helps you build your identity when at the university. The college you belong to is usually drawn from where you live in your first year, but if you live off campus, it will be which college you study on. It's impossible to study at the University of Roehampton and not identify yourself with one of the colleges here. It offers a real sense of community that is unique to the university and improves the experience of students here. So I was part of Froebel, which is where the dance um, department is located. So I lived on Froebel my first year. So that was sort of both where I study and where I live is um, what made me to join Froebel College. So this is Froebel College, which dates back to 1793. It's home to the Department of Education, one of the major teacher training centres in Britain and the Department of Dance and the Students' Union is also located here. Then we have Digby Campus, which is home to four academic departments, English and Creative Writing, Social Sciences, Drama, Theatre and Performance and the Humanities. It's also home to our amazing new library, which you can see pictured here, which was built in 2017. We also have Southlands, which is home to the Department of Business and Media, Culture and Language. And then Whitelands Campus, which is home to the Department of Life Sciences and Psychology. So when I say student life, what's the first thing that comes to mind? There are lots of different aspects to student life. So first of all, there's lectures. When you go to university, you will attend lectures. They'll be delivered by university academics who research that topic and give detail about that certain topic in the module you're studying. Mostly you'll be required to attend, listen and take notes. Depends what course you study and what university you go to as how big the lectures will be. It could be up to 200 people, for example, in one lecture. Most universities will then require you to attend a seminar after that lecture where you get broken down into smaller groups with a tutor to ask questions and speak to your classmates about the content and further reading. 
is also studying. So when you go to university, you're going to get a degree. Therefore, studying is really important. It's quite different from what you might be used to at schools or college. For example, you might go to four or five lectures a week and then be expected to do further reading and manage your assignments outside of this time. So as I was a dance student, I also had rehearsals outside of my classes for my degree in terms of if we had to get a piece together or I did a lot of production and lighting work, so I had to spend a lot of time in the theatre designing lighting for things. So depending on what course you're doing, this is something you'll have to take into consideration about what other time you'll need outside of your designated study time to fit in all the extra work you need to do. Independence. You'll experience a new independence when at university. You'll learn to cook for yourself, make new relationships, do your own washing and generally learn great life skills. Even if you choose to commute to university, you will also become more independent as you will need to manage this with your studies and getting involved with campus life. Then there's social life. At university, as well as studying for your degree, there is a lot to get involved with outside of this. For example, at Roehampton, we have Freshers' Week, Bath and Summer Ball, and I'm going to talk about a lot more of those just in a bit. So there's loads of different things you can get involved with while studying at Roehampton. This includes societies. You can join subject societies such as classics, film and philosophy. And you can also join societies in drama, dance, debating, religious societies and many, many more. There's also societies in sports like um, badminton, boxing, cheerleading, taekwondo, judo, squash and swimming. We also have restaurants all over campus, including the Union Bar, the Digby Cafe, the Hive and the Starbucks. We also have the Student Students' Union, which provides academic support, activities, campaigns, welfare events and volunteering. We also have departmental and cultural events, including comedy, karaoke, club nights, Freshers' Week, Christmas Bash and Summer Ball. As well as a range of charitable and volunteering opportunities, if we don't have a society that you're interested in, but you have an idea for your own, all you need is nine other like-minded individuals to join you and you can start your own society. So the Students' Union run a number of events, including a weekly club night on campus at BOP, a weekly club night off campus at FES, and a monthly club night off campus at Grand. All of the profits from these events go towards putting on the annual summer ball. This is a festival style, at the style event at the end of the year, often in May or very early June, um, to celebrate the end of term. They usually get some really decent artists to play at the ball. Recent ones include Scouting for Girls, Professor Green and Grizzle Kicks. When I was at Roehampton, I was part of quite a lot of societies, including Dance Society, the Competitive Dance Team, Roehampton Players Society, which is like a musical theatre drama club, and Tennis Society. I got so many opportunities and amazing experiences through all of these. I made my best friends through them, so I de definitely recommend getting involved if that's something that you're interested in. I also thought I'd take this time to mention um, study abroad. Whilst at university, you have the opportunity to study abroad in your second year and most often in the spring. Roehampton has a fantastic study abroad programme with partners all across the world, including Europe, USA, Australia and New Zealand. Study abroad is an amazing opportunity to make new people, live somewhere new, learn new cultures and become more independent and gain valuable life skills. I studied abroad in my second year in America. Uh, I was in New Jersey, so near New York, and it was the most amazing experience ever. So here is an example timetable. As you can see, there'll be scheduled time for lectures and seminars, and then you'll need to create a routine, which means you can keep on top of assignment work and further reading. So my timetable when I was at university was quite spread out. So I had time to go to the library to do work in between and fit in rehearsals. I had a lot of rehearsals for societies and competitions for shows, technical rehearsals, and I played tennis. So I had, um, you know, training for tennis and matches as well. So um, I would have league matches on Wednesday afternoons and training later on Tuesdays and Thursdays with tennis. And also at most universities, everyone has Wednesday afternoons off because that's sort of when all the league matches for all sports happen between most universities. Um, I also had a part-time job whilst I was at university. So I worked at Wimbledon Ball on Tennis Club. Um, I worked in hospitality for different events and in the cafe. And during the summer, I got to work at the championships, which was really cool. Um, this was a job I got through Roehampton. It was at the Freshers Fair, they had a stand. Um, and this was a really easy job for me to schedule around my very busy timetable because it was zero hour contract. So I could pick and choose to do as much and little as I wanted to, to fit in. So particularly in my third year, I think I was not doing as much because I had a dissertation, had competitions, had shows, had tennis, there was a lot on. So it's up to you sort of, if you think 
doing a working a job part time on top of your studies. It's just completely up to you. If you want to get a part time job, of course you can. If you don't think you can handle it as on the side of your studies, then you don't have to at all. It's just a good way to make money on the side. I was also a student ambassador for the University of Rockhampton when I worked there. So I worked open days and campus tours and things like that. So there's lots of different types of accommodation available on campus, but all of it is self-catered, meaning you're going to have to learn to cook for yourself at some point. Each of the colleges has its own accommodation. You have the option to share all facilities or get an ensuite bedroom with your own bathroom. Regardless of the type of room you choose to go for, you will definitely be sharing the kitchen and social areas with the students in the flat. The accommodation comes equipped with the basic things you need at university, but it's up to you to bring bedding, towels, toiletries, cooking utensils, crockery, cleaning products, and anything else you want to make your room feel more like home. Accommodation prices vary for first years. The price depends on what block you apply for and what type of room you have. Uh, the halls that have been most recently built will be typically more expensive. You'll also pay more if you want a semi ensuite or a full ensuite room. So if you go onto universities' um, websites to look at costs as they vary by university and on the year, when you apply for accommodation, you can make your decision based on your preferences and budget. So I lived on campus in my first year. I lived in Willow, which is on Froball, which was right near the dance facility, so it's really convenient for me. And then I lived in second year um, and third year off campus uh, at a house just five minutes away, a five minute walk that the university helped me to get in contact with the agency. And they had a good connection with them, so they were able to build it. Some of the questions I saw in the chat box during the other presentations was about if you can um, suggest to your university to live with someone in particular. So at University of Roehampton on your application form, you can put, um, I would really like to live with so-and-so and they'll take it into consideration. Doesn't mean it's 100% definitely gonna happen, but you can definitely ask and it, hopefully they can try and make that work for you. And there was also a question about if the university will help you in um, finding accommodation off campus in your second or third years. At the University of Roehampton, they have an accommodation fair where I met the agency that I ended up signing up with and they would tell you about um, how to make that work for you. So there's lots of support from the universities and many other universities will do similar things too in terms of how you can set yourself up for living off campus. Okay. Freshers week will be your very first week on campus and it is packed full of activities to help you settle into university life. There are the academic sessions, they give you information on your course and your module options. You will also enrol during Freshers Week, which is when you get your student ID card and confirm that you can have turned up to your place at university. You will also meet and get to know your flat rep during Freshers Week. Every flat floor of a student accommodation for first year undergraduates will have a flat rep living with them. The flat rep will be an older student, usually in the second or third year, who will be responsible for helping the new students to settle in, lead in social activities and be there as a calling point if a student is ever in need of help, emotionally or academically. This is especially relevant during Freshers Week when the flat rep will show the students around the campus, give them information about university life and go with them to Freshers events the RSU puts on for the week. So the social side of Freshers Week involves events ranging from meeting your RSU representatives and getting to know what's available to you on campus to club nights on and off campus. They've even hired out Fort Park for the evening so it can be used exclusively for Roehampton students. The day events, um, Finish up with the Freshers' Fair, where you can join all the clubs and societies that you're interested in and find out information about the university, pick up freebies and find out about part-time work available to you. So again, this is where I found out about um, being a student ambassador and also working at Wimbledon. Um, and the night events are topped off with the Freshers' Finale with main acts, DJs, silent disco and food court to round off the week. Here are some useful websites. Uh, to take a look at for more guidance and advice for student life and balancing student life whilst you're at university. You can also head over to our website to access our live chat function UniBuddy where you can ask your questions to available staff and current students. On the screen is also our social media platforms to provide daily updates and information about the University of Roehampton. We'd also like to point out that we have our next digital open day on June 10th, so if you head over to our website and look to the come to our digital open event section at the top, you can click on it and register for our event. But we'll be talking about all things to do with Roehampton in terms of accommodation, student life, sports, societies, everything. And then there'll also be academic ses sessions for your course where you can listen to an academic, talk about the breakdown of your course, and you can also ask them specific questions.
So um, thank you very much. I'm going to be passing back to the other Megan now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Megan. Next up, we're going to be talking. Next up, we're going to be talking to Will from the University of Kent, and he's going to be talking to you about all the different extracurriculars you can get involved in while you're at university. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Will and I am a recruitment officer at the University of Kent. So today I will be going through um, life as a University of Kent student and extracurriculars. So bear with me, I'll just share my screen. Um, okay. Right, so yeah, I'm going to be covering life outside of the degree. So first of all, I'll be going through um, student unions and what they offer, what services they offer, what sports clubs and societies we have at the University of Kent, um, working part time and any work experience on offer at the University of Kent and becoming an ambassador. So first of all, just going to give you a brief uh, background of where we are. So we were established in 1965. Um, we're based in Canterbury in East Kent and Medway in South East London. So we have campuses at those locations. And we also have a postgraduate centre in Brussels, Paris, Athens and Rome. So studying abroad is something um, that you're interested in. Uh, University of Kent have fantastic links throughout Europe and globally as well. So um, please check out our courses and um, which ones offer um, the study abroad option. So first of all, we're going to look at um, Kent Union. So most universities, if not all, have a student's union. So they are the student representative body of that particular university. So at uh, the Canterbury campus, we have our Kent Union, which is a fantastic establishment that provides a whole range of services for students, including advice and support um, surrounding all aspects of university life. So academic, welfare, housing, finance. Um, in terms of employability, we employ over 620 students at uh, Kent Union, which I'll elaborate on a little bit later on. And we provide fantastic uh, social events such as Freshers Ball, Summer Ball. We even have our own nightclub called The Venue on campus, which is great fun on a Wednesday night. Um, so in terms of getting involved in uh, all aspects of university life, um, Kent Union will definitely be the place to go to. We've got our own radio station, um, we've got their own newspaper. Um, in terms of volunteering, you can volunteer around the university or even in the local area. Um, we've got a fantastic Raise and Giving Society, uh, also known as RAG. They actually raised over £238,000 in the academic year 2018-2019, which is a great achievement. Um, they put on Charity Week um, fundraisers, so it's great to get involved. Um, we also have our student um, Kent Student Awards and Team Kent Ball, so they're great end of year um, award ceremonies, so it's a good opportunity to get dressed up and have a few drinks with your friends from either a sports society. Um, we even have Varsity Week, so that's where we would compete against our rival university in a variety of different sports, which I'll elaborate on a little bit later on. So yeah, if you, if you want to get involved with all aspects of university life, you would approach your students' union. So up in Medway, uh, we also have our students union known as GK unions. So again, um, very similar setup, uh, provide plenty of advice and support surrounding uh, university life. Um, in terms of employability, they've got over 5,000 vacancies um, around the university campus and in the Medway area, and also provide fantastic um, social events. Again, Freshers Ball, some Ball, and you can join sports clubs and societies in the Medway area as well, which I'll go into next. So in terms of societies, as you can see from the screen, there are loads to get involved with. Um, during Freshers Week and Freshers Fair, uh, we have our sports and societies clubs that come down and set up a stand in our sports centre. And that's a great opportunity for students to go along um, and have a talk to the captains or presidents of those societies, just to get an idea as when they train or when do they meet up, what's involved with being part of the club, or the fees involved. So yeah, it's a great opportunity to meet like-minded people. You've got academic societies. So for instance, um, if you're part of business school, you have the business society. So you can meet people from your course. 
um, or uh, meet people uh, doing a similar course as well. Um, in terms of um, setting up a new society, you can do that if there is scope for it. So if there is anything on that list that you can't see, you may even um, be able to set a new society up. So in terms of sports, again, we have got plenty of sports available at the University of Kent. We've got our core sports, so rugby, cricket, football. Um, we've got archery, core ball, netball. There's so many to get involved in. Um, like I say, we have a two week trial period at the um, beginning of first semester. So that's where you can go to, along to any sport or society, give it a go for two weeks, free of charge. Um, if you like it, that's fantastic, carry on. Um, if, you, if you're not sure, you can try something within that two week period. Um, kind of a bit like a try before you buy, before you get the membership. Um, there's, there's teams for all kind of levels. So depending how competitive you are, we've got first teams that compete in Bucks, which is the British University and Colleges Sport. Um, so that they can compete nationally or regionally, depending on what league they're in. Um, if you just want to um, play a bit of sport, a bit of fun with your mates, a bit more socially, we do have social teams um, available and you can even represent uh, your college. So the University of Kent is also a um, collegiate university, so you can represent the college. So again, we've got um, a variety of different um, levels of sport to get involved with. So it, it's not necessarily, oh, I'm not the first team, it doesn't matter. There, there's, there's up to five teams and some clubs as well. So in terms of um, non-competitive sport and exercising, again, the University of Kent have got you covered. Um, on our Canterbury campus, we have a two-storey gym. Uh, so we've got the fitness and cardio suite upstairs and we've got free weight section downstairs. Um, they, we even have a physiotherapy and massage clinic within that gym. Um, as well as this, we've got three sports halls. So they, you can play squash, badminton, table tennis, volleyball. Um, during Wednesday, uh, we've got Bucks Wednesday, so that's when all visiting universities come, and it's a great, it's a great day. Um, so there's plenty to get involved with, and actually, as of September 2020, for all first years, uh, Kent Sport membership will be free, which is which is a fantastic um, gesture, and it's great to get involved with. Um, as well as this, we've also got our outdoor facilities. We've got a brand new tennis centre, which have four tennis courts going up. Uh, that should be ready around September. Um, as well as this, we've got a 3G pitch, 3GX pitch and an Astro. So uh, Gillingham Football Club, who are a professional football team, they actually use our facilities during the week and on weekends, uh, their academy team. So it just goes to show how good our facilities are. As well as this, we also have a cycle hub. Uh, where you can rent a bike for a day. So you can cycle to lectures, you can cycle into town, or you can even cycle to the beach, which is about six miles away. So if you're not into sports, you're more into the art side of things. Um, again, university have got you covered. Uh, we have our own theatre on site called the Golbenkian Theatre. It's got a capacity of 340 people, and we even have a cinema within that theatre as well. Um, so if you want to get involved with dance, drama, acting, music, there's plenty of societies to get involved with. You can join Ken Choir, Ken Orchestra. So if music and drama or acting um, is, is more your thing, there are plenty of opportunities to get involved at the University of Kent. So in terms of work experience, I mentioned earlier that um, the Students' Union employ over 620 people throughout the university, um, either at the nightclub or around bars. So over 75% of University of Kent students are actually working part-time, which is a great number. Um, so what you can do, you can register to our job shop online. So you would upload your CV. They'll even help you with your CV, um, just to tinker it maybe. Um, and they'll be able to source jobs that are relevant to your CV. Um, it's a great way of earning a bit of money on the side and also gaining valuable work experience whilst at university. Um, however, it's just a general rule of thumb. Universities sort of recommend no more than 10 to 15 hours paid work per week, just purely because we don't want it to inhibit your, your studies. Obviously, that's the primary reason why you're at university. Um, so it's up to you. It's, it's obviously how you manage your time, but that's just the general rule of thumb. Um, I know at the University of Kent, there's a lot of students that work in the bars throughout the, the campus. Um, they work, we've got two co-op shops on campus as well, they work in there, they've got reception at the gym, 
you can work as a gym instructor, you can work in the theatre, you can work at the um, cinema as well. So yeah, there's plenty of opportunities to to get part-time work if you're looking for it. So these are just a few skills that you would pick up just during um, working part-time at university. You may not even think of it at the time, um, but these skills are valuable going into the working world and graduate employers actually kind of look for these skills. Um, so in terms of time management, responsibility, um, organization skills and teamwork, they're all vital skills that, again, whilst you're having fun on the job and earning a bit of money, you may not even realize that you're, you're actually gaining these skills. Um, like I say, so for, for, for instance, a day may involve, um, you've got lectures at nine o'clock, you may have a seminar in the afternoon, and then you might have work in the evening, six till 10. So managing your time, prioritizing your university work, but also um, being committed enough and organized enough to get yourself to work as well um, is fantastic going into the working world. So also at the University of Kent, you can become an ambassador. So you can either become an individual department ambassador or a general university ambassador. So an individual department ambassador would be um, representing your academic school, um, either business, uh, law, history, whichever there it is. Um, you would assist during recruitment days. So basically, um, prospective students would come down to university either with their families or with the school. Um, and you would just give a little bit of information as to what studying at Kent is like and what studying that particular subject is like. Um, again, it's a great way of gaining valuable work experience and also earning a little bit of money on the side. Um, as a general university ambassador, so that's where you would um, host and take campus tours during open days. Obviously, at the moment, um, with the current situation, not many people can travel around. So we do have virtual tours on our website. Um, that's where you can visit accommodation, um, you can have a little walk around campus virtually. Um, so that might be worth checking out. But like I say, if you want, um, if there's any information that you need um, becoming an ambassador, you can visit the link in the slide. So in terms of just following on from all this, uh, we've got a great careers employability service at the university that will be able to help you throughout your studies and up to three years after you graduate. So all that experience you're gaining through either volunteering, through the union charity events, working part time, being a captain or social secretary during a sports society, you would gain all that valuable experience and our career service will be able to put that onto your CV and help you find and narrow down which jobs you might be um, appropriate for. Um, as well as this, we've got an employability points scheme. So that's where you can join up and register. And that's where over 147 companies provide 800 rewards. So what you do, you would log all your work experience, your roles and responsibilities, your volunteering, um, and that would be converted into points. And you may be eligible for a reward. And that is nationally recognized. Companies such as Santander um, buy into that as well. So it's a great way of gaining valuable experience whilst at university and bridging that gap between university and working life. Um, so again, if you need any more information on how to register for the uh, point scheme, you can visit the link at the bottom of the slide there. So lastly, um, we also have a careers fair and employability festival. Um, they're both held at the Canterbury and Medway campuses. So this is where, um, as you can see, there's a whole range of companies will come down and they'll set up a stand and they'll be there for about two weeks. And it's a great opportunity for students to go along and have a chat as to either what um, work placement schemes they have, graduate schemes they may have, or different roles um, that may be available after university. Um, they provide talks and workshops as to what they expect from graduates and what, what the working world is like. So it's a fantastic opportunity for students to go along and see what is available and maybe narrow down their options because obviously not everyone knows what they want to do after university um, so it's, a, it's great to have a good a good idea as to what you want to do or what you don't want to do okay so that's bringing me towards the end of the presentation so um, if you need any more information on sports and societies or volunteering or how to uh, register for any, any of the extracurriculars at the University of Kent please visit the Kent Union website um, you can chat to myself um, or my colleagues on UniBuddy. And like I say, you can even visit us virtually 
um, on the University of Kent website. So you can do a campus tour or uh, have a look around the accommodation. Okay, so I hope that's answered a few questions, giving you an insight as to what life is like outside of the degree. So I'm just going to pass you back over to Megan. Thank you very much, Will. Now, thank you to everyone that submitted questions in advance. And also if you've put through questions on Zoom or on YouTube, we're now going to work through some of those with your panelists and help you get some answers to those. So we're gonna start off with Lauren from the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. What expectations did you have about student life before you went to university, Lauren? And were they different to your experiences? Yeah, so I went to university um, a year after most of my friends because I chose to do different A-levels halfway through sixth form. So I'd always see things on their social media about their experiences and making friends and going out and socialising in freshers events or student nights. And it made me really excited to join university. But once I got there, I learned that it was so much more than that. And I mean, yeah, the socialising aspects are really important and fun, but there are so many more aspects that make up the university experience. I had to learn how to look after myself properly, you know, financially, physically and emotionally. But there are a lot of people there to help you at university. And if I can give any advice, it's to utilise that. Normally in universities, it has been mentioned that there are student services and they're made up of people who can help you cope with all different aspects of university life. Whether that's finances, finding bursaries, counselling or help with writing essays or if you just need someone to talk to, they're all there for you. So make sure you use that. Thank you very much, Lauren. Next up, we have a question for Usman from the University of Bradford. If you get homesick, is it still worth staying at university? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, I think the reality is when you're going to university, um, you know, you're going into new experience for a lot of students. They're moving away for the first time from their families. You know, it might be the first and only time um, you're living on your own, even if you're a local student, you know, coming onto campus and spending all of your day there um, and having to take the responsibility um, and developing that independence can make you feel um, very lonely or homesick or missing your friends. Um, but I would say, you know, that feeling will pass. Try and get involved um, in your programme and with other students. Um, so lots of my colleagues have mentioned things like the student union. So in your first week at university, most universities will have freshers fairs. Um, you know, I know particularly when I came to university, the, the friends that I made, um, I made whilst signing up to get my university card um, because we were all there on the same course. Um, most university courses will have an induction day or an induction session um, during that first week. So you'll you'll have a chance to meet students and be introduced to them. Um, so hopefully you'll get to know people immediately. I think it's in the times when you're not around people that you might feel homesick. So if you're in your accommodation on your own at the end of the day, um, remember, you know, we've got a lot of technology available to us. So in the current circumstances, we're all using Zoom to call our friends and to do quizzes, etc., cetera, um, and to stay in touch with people that we can't see physically. So hopefully this will help you in those times as well. So when you go to university and you are feeling homesick, use the technology that you're using currently to stay in touch with your friends and family. Um, and I think everybody does feel homesick, everybody does feel lonely, but there's a lot of help and support available. Um, societies, a student union, um, people on your course, and you can speak to staff, academics and ambassadors as well who will be able to direct you to any other services. So I would say, you know, yes, you're going to university, it's going to be a fun and great experience. On the other hand, it can be quite challenging, um, but don't give up. You've worked so hard to get here, you know, try and settle in and meet people, etc., and do what you can to get involved. And if those feelings continue, then yes, that, you know, speak to your academics. Um, most universities have a counselling team, so it could be, you know, other challenges that you're facing as well. So try and get the help and support um, in the network that's available, but know that these are very common feelings. Most people feel like this. And I think if you stay over that initial week and that initial period, very quickly you'll make a very strong group of friends 
um, and those feelings will sort of settle and dissipate. Okay, so I hope that answers that question. Uh, back to Megan. Thank you very much, Esmond. That was a really detailed and great answer. Next up, we're gonna to talk to Megan from Roehampton. If I don't live in university halls or if I commute from home, do you think this would affect my studies, my social life and making friends at university? Hi, um, I think obviously if you're commuting from home, then you're gonna have a bit more travel time, which could affect um, a tiny bit of just day-to-day -day activities, but 100% not going to affect your, your studies and making friends and social life because there's plenty of opportunities to do that if you don't live on campus. Something I really recommend is that um, most universities will have like a Facebook freshers page where you can add yourself and join this group and it will come up with lots of different things to help you meet new people before you start because I understand that can be one of the most overwhelming things before you go to university. I was like, I don't know anyone. How am I going to meet new friends? I don't know anything about anyone. So I joined this page where you can see where everyone is living. So you can try and find out who's living in the same block as you or something. But if you're commuting from home, you can also see when all the events are and um, lots of links to join up to social media platforms for societies and other things you're interested in. And these are ways of making new friends. So even if you're commuting from home, and you're not living on campus, it won't affect like how many friends you make in your social life because it's, it's what you make of it. So if you look out for social media platforms or different societies or the events, they will tell you when things are going on. You'll also make great friends with the people on your course and perhaps some of them are commuting, some of them are living on campus. So, and so you can have like um, the, the difference between the two and you can help each other out and letting each other know when things are going on and things like that. So you're, you're definitely not going to miss out if you're commuting. That's great. Thank you very much, Megan. Next up, we have a question for Will from the University of Kent. Lots of people have talked about the student union today, but could you break down for us exactly what is the role of the student union in the university? Yeah, no worries. So um, the Students' Union is the student representative body. Um, so it's the eyes, ears and voice of that particular university. Um, so their main role is to provide a, a variety of services for students. Um, I mentioned in the presentation that they've got plenty of academic and welfare support. Um, should you be struggling for whatever reason, um, there's always someone to turn to. Um, in terms of sports and societies, they, they provide a whole range of sports societies that cater for a lot of people's needs. Like I say, even if um, there isn't a sports society that wasn't on the list and you, you think of something, you may even be able to set up a sports society um, if there's enough scope for it. Um, so yeah, the main role for the students union is to provide as much of um, academic support, but also uh, social events for university students to really thrive and enjoy their university experience. Um, so like I say, they've got uh, volunteering, they've got charity events, they've got sports and societies. Um, you can get involved with uh, the community. So there's plenty to get involved with. And so the main reason for the Students' Union is to provide a safe and controlled environment where students can really thrive in various aspects of uh, university life. Back to Megan. That's great. Thank you very much, Will. Next up, we have a question for Lauren. How do we get the best out of online open days in terms of looking at accommodation? Will universities only show us the best options for their accommodation? Um, are there things that I need to look out for when I'm looking at accommodation online? Hi. Um, yeah, so um, obviously with the current situation that's happening, um, we at UWTSD, and I know that many other universities are doing the same, are given the option to do um, open days online and virtual tours, things like that. So um, although you don't have that experience of physically talking to someone, you will be able to talk to someone online. Um, making sure that where you where you are looking at, um, you know, the spaces there are, are comfortable um, and they suit your needs. Um, and yeah, getting the, the best out of whoever you can speak to on the open days. Um, with the open days with UWTSD, you can go on, online um, and easily find when they're available and there's taster days for different sessions, things like that. So you're not missing out. So make sure that you have a look online and get those facilities for you. Back to Megan. 
Thank you very much, Lauren. Next up, a question for us then from the University of Bradford. What would you suggest students attending universities such as Oxbridge or studying medicine with a high work workload and a study focus do for income whilst they're at university? Great question. Um, I think I was seeing a lot of this in the question box as well. Um, remember, if you're going to university, you know, you are going to study, that's your key aim. Um, so necessarily, if you don't need to work, um, you don't have to do it, you know, but a lot of students um, due to financial reasons also in terms of developing key skills uh, for future working choose to work. Lots of my colleagues have already mentioned, um, if you are going to universities like Oxbridge, uh, for example, and you think the workload's really, really heavy and the focus is going to be on academics, um, you know, there are student jobs on campus. So a lot of my colleagues have said the student ambassador roles, for example, and these are roles that work outside. Um, they're very flexible alongside a degree. It might be doing a campus tour. It might be um, sharing a bit about your university experience. Um, so those jobs that are on campus, so you don't have to travel to them necessarily, um, that are very flexible around your studies. Um, I think they would be really, really key um, for those students um, who are worried about like academic workload. Um, but remember, you know, even if financially you need a job, like I mentioned in my presentation, there's lots of grants and there's a lot of scholarships. So do try and speak to like the money advice team or the students union to see are there pots of money that you can access that might mean you don't need to take that part-time job. Um, yeah, thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Osman. Next, we have a question for Megan from the University of Roehampton. What is a normal day at university like? Um, so a normal day, I guess every day is quite different. It depends on if, if you're signed up to a bunch of societies or things. I guess for if I take a normal day from my time at university, I would say first lecture would probably be about 9 a.m. Um, and it'd probably be a practical class. Um, so I'd have a technique class for dance and then followed by maybe two hours of break where I would go to the library and work on some assignments. And then followed by a lecture um, with pretty much everyone in my course. And then straight after a seminar on that certain lecture where it would be broken down uh, into smaller groups and we'd be able to discuss what happened in the lecture. And then in the evenings, I would probably have four hours of rehearsal for both my my course plus also extracurriculars that I were doing and then perhaps going out in the evening as well so it's quite full-on but it, it depends it depends what you sign up to if you've got a part-time job if you if you're a part of societies um, and what course it is you're studying so say you have a presentation on Wednesday you might be meeting up with some of um, the people that you're doing a presentation with to work through it and you know who's going to talk about which bit make sure the presentation's all good to go um, you also might just be spending some time in Starbucks um, over lunch and um, just talking about nothing to do with study just general life so um, I would say that university days are quite it can, can be quite full-on if you if you choose to but say you set out a timetable where you're, you haven't got much on in terms of lectures or classes that day, but you choose to go to the library and get loads of work done, that still can be really productive. So yeah, thanks Megan. Thank you very much Megan. Next up we have a question for Will. With societies, do you need to have had previous experience of playing a sport or perhaps be a certain level for a musical instrument to be able to join a society at university or do they accept a wide range of different abilities? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually, because a, a lot of people might be put off going to university and joining a sports club society thinking, oh, I haven't played that sport before. I'm not very good. I'm just not going to do it. Um, that's not the case. So at the University of Kent, like I say, we have our um, Freshers' Fair, our Sports Society's Fair. So it doesn't matter if you've played the sport at international level or if you've never played the sport at all. They are, there's plenty of tiers in terms of ability. There's always coaches, there's always people on hand to provide support um, along the way. So for instance, um, 
if they have external coaches for for the sports so you get top quality coaching within within that specific area so yeah it, it really doesn't matter if you've never touched a, a hockey stick before or if you've never you know picked up a guitar um, there's always people on hand to help you every step of the way um, and that's what's so good about it um, you know there's, there's I know I know a few people that They've joined university and they've, they've never played tennis before and by the end by the end of university they were really good so it's a great way of meeting new people learning new skills and like i say um with that two week trial period is actually a really good opportunity to try your hand at a whole range of things um like i say you got that free free taste sessions for two weeks so if like i say if you if you've never played american football before or if you've never um, sang in a choir before, you can go along, give it a try, um, you've got nothing to lose um, and you may really enjoy it, you might really get along with the people you've met. Um, so yeah, like I say, um, in short, it doesn't matter if you've you've never done that particular sport society before, there will be guidance and support throughout. Back to Megan. Thank you very much, Will. Next up, we're going to go for another question for Lauren from the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. So as Megan mentioned earlier, you can ask to be put into accommodation with someone that you already know, um, but that only happens in a very small amount of cases. So most people aren't going to know their flatmates before they go to university. Is there a way that the university can help you link up with people that you're going to live with beforehand? How does that happen and whenabouts is it going to happen? Yeah, so like Megan mentioned, um, you do have some input um, to some degree um, who you live with, um, but normally the accommodation office will get in touch with you at the beginning of September to allocate your room. Um, you're then uh, added to Facebook groups, different social media platforms. Um, most people, I remember when I first joined, would post, um, you know, it's, it's a private group, would post where, where they were. Um, you'd be able to then start little group chats um, with people who are specifically living in your flat but you are normally put with people who are on the same course as you which is really useful because you can get together um, to do group studying you can either you know crash in the living room and do a, a little study session or just walk into lectures together really getting to know your classmates as well as you know li living with them on a, on a personal level so there's there's lots of different things that that you can do um, in terms of social media and, and getting to know people before you before you start yeah back to megan thank you very much lauren along the same lines um we have this next question for usman um obviously you are going to be a big group of people going to university for the first time what would you recommend doing if you don't really get along with your housemates thank you great question again um yeah, obviously you're coming to university, you're meeting a lot of new people, you know, you're, you're not always going to get on with people, particularly in your accommodation. If you don't get on with people, most universities will have something like an accommodation warden or a house warden. Um, so I know for us, particularly, we have house wardens. So if you are really struggling to get on with them or, you know, it's quite challenging living in the same space, um, you can speak to your house warden and then they will look to move you um, into a space that's more appropriate so that you can get to know other people as well. Um, and it might happen that actually as you start your course, um, you, you find out that there's somebody else living in your accommodation and actually you get on, on with them and this particular person you don't get on with, you can then speak to your house warden and maybe they'll move you as well. Um, so a lot of the time the accommodation team are quite supportive um, and particularly when there's a bit of a personality clash and it can really um, damage your experience at university they're definitely willing to help um, but do remember obviously you're coming across new people at university and you, you're never going to get on with everyone um, but you do want your experience at accommodation to be good so don't worry about that too much already I think um, you know face that situation when you get there and lots of universities are there to help you so even if you don't know where to get the help and support Remember that you can always speak to your academic team. You know, you'll have a programme leader. Um, there'll be student ambassadors on your course as well, or older students who act as mentors. So there's lots of places where you can get advice and guidance. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Next up, we have a question for Megan from the University of Roehampton. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of stuff that you want to take with you to university, a big list of things to pack. How would you recommend knowing what to bring and what to leave at home, especially if we're moving into self-catered? What kind of things should you be bringing along with you to university? It's a really good question. I think um, the first thing is don't pack up your entire house and bring it because um, you won't need absolutely everything, although you might feel like you want to, especially when you're moving out of home for the first time. Um, the basic things I guess that you should think about bringing are, you know, your cutlery, cups and plates and things like that. At least one, you know, you need at least one knife and one fork and one spoon. Um, things like a clothes horse that you might not think about, but like when you do your washing, if, if there's no, if you don't want to pay for tumble dryer and you just want to hang it out <laughs> to dry, a uh, clothes horse can be a really good one. Um, most universities, um, like the washing facilities won't exactly be, you know, right in your flat. You might have to walk a fair, like across the road to go and do it or something. So one of those, you know, like the, an Ikea bag or one of those big bags that you can put all your washing in and take over so that you can leave that, have it washed and dried or whatever, and then bring it back. So things like that. Um, and just, I think some nice, you know, sentimental things or things for your room to help if you are feeling a bit homesick, just to make it feel a bit more homely. So it's just, most universities will have a pin board or something where you can put some pictures and you can have some you know some lights and books and things just to make it feel a bit more at home so just probably try not to bring everything you've ever owned because there probably won't be as much space as you may have at your parents home or wherever you've been living before um but definitely just to to bring some nice things to make you feel this place where you're going to maybe you might be living on campus for three years is going to be your home for the next three years. So just to make it feel like you're at home. Back to Megan. Thank you very much, Megan. Next up, we have a question for Will. When you're joining a society, is there a certain number that you would recommend joining? Is there a limit on that? And do you have to pay to be able to join societies? Hi there. Um, there isn't a limit as such, however, it does come down to individual preference and budget because there is a membership fee for each sport or society um, and it does vary in price, so I can't quote any prices. Um, but yes, in terms of time management as well, um, you've got to be able to, obviously you've got to prioritise your university degree. Um, you might have to uh, factor in part-time work. So it really depends. I mean, I personally only did one sport. I did rugby at university and that was time consuming in itself. You had your training, you had matches during the week and you had to fit around your lectures and seminars and also part time work as well. So um, it's really up to you. It depends um, how you feel you can manage your time. If you feel you can do one or two societies, great. Um, if you feel like you can only do one, that's fine you don't want to spread yourself thin that's that's my recommendation um you don't want to be 70 percent or 60 percent in three or four different things you want to be 100 percent um degree and you'll be 100 percent in the sport society because um if you can't manage your time you might one of them might uh, slack so yeah again it's down to individual preference whether you can manage your time uh budget in terms can you afford multiple memberships and uh whether you which um, sports society you're going to prioritise. So back to Megan. Thank you very much, Will. Next up, we have a question for Lauren. We're going to have one more question for each of our panellists today. Um, so Lauren, when you're thinking about travelling home, how often do you recommend travelling home to see friends, family? Um, should there be a limit to how many times you think you should travel home during the term if you're living on campus? Um, I don't think there's a limit as such, really. Um, it's all about balancing um, your degree with, you know, out, outside aspects. So if you, you know, if you want to travel home, that's completely up to you. Um, you do have time to do that. Um, there are reading weeks that you normally have throughout the term that are similar to like a half term. Um, and you can use them to go home or if you're close enough to travel home on the weekend. Um, 
you know, there was a lot of people who did travel home, but also, you know, making sure you get that balance of social life as well um, and sticking around and, you know, having fun, fun with friends on campus or, or nearby. Um, so, yes, definitely it's up to you um, if that's something that you felt you needed to do, then, yeah, go for it. Thanks. Back to Megan. Thank you very much, Lauren. Next up, we have a question for Usman. When you're looking at studying abroad, are there any kind of grants that you can apply for to support you while you study abroad? Or can you apply for specific loans from the university at all? Yeah, um, so again, with this question, a lot of the study abroad programmes, um, they'll be delivered or you'll get some support from your careers team or your employability team. Um, or your placements team as well within your programme. Um, for a lot of these um, opportunities, there'll already be money um, attached to them. So for some of our study abroad programmes, for example, all of your costs um, going out will be covered um, and there'll be some maintenance grant that you can have access to whilst you're there as well. So there will be some support offered. But what I would say, again, um, you know, try and do some research. So similar to the sort of budget, budgeting tips that I gave, um, for living away at university or going to university in September, think about and do a bit of research about how expensive um, the country is that you're going to, other cities where you're going to, what your accommodation costs and your living costs will be. Um, and then look out for bursaries and grants that you can apply to. So there'll be lots um, within your university, but there's actually lots of charities that can um, support these experiences as well. Um, and there might be companies as well that can sort of sponsor your study abroad year, depending on the fields that you're studying. So I know particularly for us, like something like games, animation, visual effects, um, students will go abroad for a year working with different um, programming companies. Um, and that has been covered by the university. But again, it's speaking to the placement teams, the employability teams, to make sure you've got the full facts. Um, and there are shorter opportunities as well, so not just the one year placement year. Um, there's lots of summer opportunities. There might be six week opportunities. We have a China business program, for example, so you can go away for shorter periods of, periods of time um, if you feel that, you know, I can't really go away for a year or it's not something that I want to do for a year. So there are other opportunities as well. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Next up, we have a question for Megan. So in terms of societies, um, do you have different LGBTQ societies, BMME societies, the different universities that you can get involved in? Yeah, so you, you can have not necessarily just subject-based societies like dance or music or something, uh, but there's societies in um, like all of those different things that you mentioned before, religious societies, all of that. You, and at Freshers' Fair, they will all have their own table uh, where you can go up and talk to them about what their society aims to do and what they provide to the members of that society. Um, and you'll be able to look at all their social media about who the, who the committee is. So they often have, you know, like a president of the society, the vice president, perhaps a, um, like the treasurer and media officer and things like that for each one. Um, but there is definitely lots of societies. Each university website, you know, has different societies available. But if you go onto their website, there will be a section, for example, for the University of Roehampton. On our website, we have a page for societies where you can see all of the societies available. And you can look on their individual page about what they do and who's part of the committee and the cost of the membership and everything like that. So there are more societies than just sports and subject societies. But everything you mentioned and more. You can even have society and cheese and wine, believe it or not. So, yeah. Great, thank you very much, Megan. Next up, we have our last question. This is one for Will. So when you're at university, you are responsible for your own study. What happens if you need to take time off the university? You're sick, if you miss some lectures or some seminars, is there a way that you can catch up easily at university or is it gonna be an issue? Um, yeah, so there's plenty of support and welfare services in place at universities. I, I think they're across all universities. So what you would do if you are struggling for whatever reason, um, you would approach that service and you would let them know and they'll let the, uh, the academic school know um, about your circumstances. 
and you depending on the circumstances you might be able to be given a bit of time off from your studies um like i say at the university of Kent, we've got a fantastic support and welfare service so they're on hand for any psychological or uh, phys physical impairment so um utilize those um services don't don't stress yourself out there is someone to turn to should you need to talk to anyone um and also if you are struggling don't just disappear um, definitely let someone know um let the services know and they can help you and guide you throughout um whatever the problem is um and in terms of uh catching up with your university work um they may even be able to uh send out some handouts or some lecture slides or some lecture notes so you can keep in touch with your academics even if you need a bit of a breather from it um you can keep in touch with it um and in terms of exams you may even get um, ex um you may even get a bit of extra time as well so again please um whichever university you're going to look at just check out their support services and what they offer and um get in contact whenever you feel you need to um get in contact with those services thank you Thank you very much, Will. Thank you to all of our panellists for their time going through your questions today. If you have left a question in the Q&A box on Zoom, then our, our panellists will be working through that just after the webinar to make sure you've got all the answers that you need. That was our last live question today. So if we weren't able to answer your question today, or if you have something else that you'd like to ask, you can always go onto our panellists website and make sure that you go to the contact details section and get in touch with them there. You can also head over to our website and sign up for our next lot of webinar Wednesdays, which will do it over June and into July. Um, next week, we are back with the personal statement webinar. So if you missed our last one, or you just wanted to get a different perspective on personal statements, then the University of Law will be heading up a really fantastic and detailed session on how to craft a perfect personal statement, what to include, how to structure it, and giving you lots and lots of tips. So definitely head over to our website. That's www.ukuniversitysearch.com. Click on the purple webinars button, and you'll be able to view all of our upcoming webinars and you can sign up to all of them or just the ones you're really interested in for free on there as well. We also have an incredible virtual fair happening on Wednesday, the 17th of June. So if you're missing out on going over to university open days, you're not sure which ones that you want to get involved in. Perhaps you're worried about your predicted grades not coming through as well as you expected them to. Then definitely get involved with our virtual fair. It's completely free to sign up. Over 90 different universities and colleges from across the UK will be there. There's some incredible universities getting involved and it's definitely a really good opportunity for you if you're a little bit confused about what you're going to do next. So you can head over to our website www.ukuniversitysearch.com, scroll down and click virtual fair, you can find out more information and sign up completely free of charge there as well. So I'm sure you want to say a massive thank you with me to all of our panellists today. We had Lauren Williams from the University of Wales Trinity St David, Usman Ahmed from the University of Bradford, Megan Morris from the University of Roehampton and Will Alkin from the University of Kent. They've all given us so much fantastic information and I hope you know more about what it's like to be an undergraduate student now. Um, so that's it from us today. Thank you very much for viewing and from me and the University Search team, stay home and stay safe.